before getting before getting started today, I just wanted to take the time to thank everyone who made this note possible, including my faculty advisor, Professor Gilchrist, uh, the Law Review Editorial and Executive Boards, as well as my family, who is my internal support system. Felon disenfranchisement laws are laws which allow a state to deprive a citizen of the right to vote based on a felony conviction. These laws vary by jurisdiction, so some jurisdictions disenfranchise every felon permanently, some disenfranchise no felons at all, um, but most fall somewhere in between. Uh, fel excuse me. A felon disenfranchisement law is a collateral consequence of a felony conviction, which are legal and social barriers that prohibit felons from reintegrating into society. Felon disenfranchisement statutes were first found in ancient Greece and Rome and were known as civil death statutes, which allowed a person who had committed a crime um, to not be able to vote or to participate in the colony's governance. Uh, this eventually expanded throughout Europe and to the American colonies, um, and then was revitalized during the Reconstruction Era with the passage of the 15th and 14th Amendments. So the 14th Amendment conditioned the right to vote on, uh, excuse me, conditioned disenfranchisement laws on a person's participation in rebellion or other crime. This eventually led to the expansion of criminal laws and also to the incarceration and disenfranchisement of recently emancipated African Americans. Felon disenfranchisement is typically challenged through litigation under the Equal Protection Clause in the Voting Rights Act. However, felons have experienced limited relief under the Equal Protection Clause because of the 14th Amendment, which states that states can disenfranchise based on participation in rebellion or other crimes. Uh, additionally, the Supreme Court has held that felons have no fundamental right to vote, so felons experience limited relief unless they can find both a racially motivated intent as well as a racially motivated effect. Finding an effect is relatively simple because you can pull up numbers and statistics of how many people of uh, minority races are disenfranchised as opposed to uh, white people, but finding a racially motivated intent is harder unless you have access to a legislature's media minutes or explicit statements from legislatures. And even if you do have the racially motivated intent, states are still afforded the opportunity to cleanse their statutes of, rach of racial animus by amending them very, very uh, inconsequentially. The Voting Rights Act uh, revolutionized felon dis excuse me, disenfranchisement litigation because now felons, excuse me, now disenfranchised populations no longer had to prove a racially motivated intent, rather just a racially uh, disparate effect of voting practices. There, however, is a circuit split as to whether the Voting Rights Act applies to felon uh, voting rights and whether the Voting Rights Act protects felon voting rights. So some circuits have held that felons can challenge disenfranchisement statutes under the Voting Rights Act, but other circuits have held that voting rights of felons are not protected under the Voting Rights Act. Uh, unfortunately, the Supreme Court has yet to grant cert to any case specifically on this issue, so felons are left with uncertainty at best. There are a couple of arguments that states who do disenfranchise felons put forward as convincing arguments to continue disenfranchisement, uh, namely the purity of the bail box argument, the social contract theory, and also the non-racial roots argument. The first argument, the purity of the bail box, is two-pronged in the fact that there's a morality rationale and also a voter fraud rationale. The, the voter fraud rationale of this argument states that felons have a criminal propensity and are therefore more likely to commit voter fraud if given the opportunity. However, this argument is not backed up by any sort of evidence, uh, which makes it lose most of its backbone. The morality-based argument states that a felon is more likely to commit a, commit a crime and therefore is more motivated to vote for initiatives that will weaken criminal justice policies. However, this argument also has no evidence behind it. And even if there were evidence to show that felons were more likely to vote for le more lenient criminal justice policies, uh, the Supreme Court has repeatedly held that a state cannot disenfranchise a group of voters because of how they'll vote or because of their common interest, which makes this argument lose its validity. Um, additionally, the United States has never enforced any sort of morality test when it comes to voting. And it becomes ironic that now that now that that inexplicable test becomes a deciding factor as to whether a population gets the right to vote back or not. The social contract theory states that 
an individual has committed a crime, has violated the social contract, and therefore is, is not entitled to a voice in their own governance. However, there's also problems with this argument as well. Uh, the social contract theory comes from a basis where all individuals start from an ideal bargaining position and then assent to the laws that are made. Um, unfortunately, the majority of the felon population comes from communities of color as well as low-income communities who are wholly underrepresented in any lawmaking offices. Um, additionally, the social contract theory is based off of the idea that, excuse me, the idea that one who violates a social contract can redeem themselves through a narrowly tailored remedy. However, as felon disenfranchisement statutes operate as a matter of law, they can apply to any felon for any felony. And so it's hard to argue that this is an individualized consideration. The non-racial roots argument it argues that felon disenfranchisement statutes, though having a racially disproportionate effect, are not a problem in themselves because they were established in a time where they were not targeted to disenfranchised communities of color. Uh, however, this argument, whether felon disenfranchisement statutes are rooted in racism or not, becomes inconsequential and excuse me, inconsequential when you observe the, com the effect of these statutes on communities of color. Nationally, one in 13 African Americans are disenfranchised because of felon disenfranchisement statutes. And this number can be as high as one in five in some states. Compare that with one in 56 non-African American people who are disenfranchised as a result of felon disenfranchisement statutes. So as it stands, even those numbers in effect show that a non-racial roots argument is inconsequential and should not govern the conversation of whether these statutes are legitimate or not. There's other problems with the current implementation of felon disenfranchisement statutes, including the complexity of such laws and the incompetent administration of such laws, which leads to de facto disenfranchisement or the disenfranchisement of people who would otherwise be eligible to vote. This includes people who are incorrectly labeled as felons who are not actually felons or felons who qualify to vote but because of incompetent administration are otherwise turned away from the voting polls. Um, additionally, a lot of these programs run on executive discretion which leaves them open to abuse of discretion and lack of oversight and leads to the consideration of multiple factors which should never be um, evaluated in deciding whether someone should be able to vote or not. This includes church attendance, family histories, uh, their tendency to vote either conservatively or liberally, and when they are denied the right to vote, the government does not have to give them a reason as to why. Lastly, these schemes run on arbitrary waiting periods and fines. So in some jurisdictions, uh, a felon may have to wait 10 years after successfully completing their sentence and successfully um, being reintegrated into society <coughs> to be able to vote. Um, there's never been a stated reason as to why such arbitrary waiting periods are convincing. Um, additionally, when it comes to fines, felons more times than not have to pay back all court costs associated with their conviction and can also be forced to pay things including child support to be able to be eligible to vote again, um, or even a civil rights restoration fine, which has um, been decided by courts as not to be a poll tax, but also but <coughs> legitimate because you're paying for your civil rights to be restored rather than waiting for your right to vote, or paying for your right to vote to be restored. Because of all of these issues and unconvincing arguments, I have suggested two, kind of three, um, adaptations that states can adopt. Uh, I would lobby for the complete abolition of felon disenfranchisement statutes as they serve no legitimate purpose and are irrelevant to any sort of retributive or rehabilitative factor. Um, this abolition can either come through state legislatures who can pass legislation abolishing such crime, or excuse me, such laws, or change can come through the citizens of each state. Um, in Florida in 2018, the Amendment 4 was passed, which Florida used to be actually one of the worst offenders of felon disenfranchisement laws and disenfranchised more felons than any state in the United States. And through Amendment 4, though they will still keep some laws in felon disenfranchisement, it makes the laws a lot more lenient, and now over one million people will be able to vote in 2020. Uh, if states are still motivated to keep felon disenfranchisement laws, I would lobby for de facto reenfranchisement which would uh, operate similar to Nevada's passage of their felon disenfranchisement laws in 2001. So the way that this process worked was that the, a felon, when they left prison, applied to other civil rights restored, um, and 
after applying, they were automatically granted voting rights unless the executive clemency committee found a reason at why it's, they should not be able to vote. And if they found reason for them not to be able to vote, the felon would be notified of these grounds and have a chance to contest the findings. Um, overall, I would lobby for the complete abolition as the vote, the voice and representation of all citizens is essential to a successful democracy. Thank you.